All right, so we have a two hour delay. And uh, when I'm doing fifth and sixth grade science, and we're getting into our testing season for the ice step, and we have two hour delays, that means there's no science, then your science teacher goes, Wah! So, I'm making a video. I want you to watch the video. I'm going to go through chapter seven, lesson four for you. There is an assignment tomorrow um, that will cover this information. Um, it's a little bit uh, more in detail than the viruses, um, but you'll be able to get through it just fine. I don't think you'll have any problems. So when we talk about fungi, fungus, okay, so that's one of our kingdoms that we talk about. And we're going to look at specifically some information about a fungus um, that fungus require and that make them true to be a fungus, why they're a fungus versus a plant. So the first thing that we need to understand is that when we talk about fungus, we need to have a particular habitat for it to live. We haven't gotten into habitats because that's actually the next book that we'll be uh, getting into. But habitats are the location that organisms are going to live, and we know a fungus is an organism. So when we talk about fungus and what they need, they need a moist, warm place in order to grow. So mo moist, warm places, you have the tropics in the fall, spring, summer, you have inside of the wooded areas where you have trees that are falling down and you see funguses growing. Um, in the spring, you'll start seeing toadstools and mushrooms popping out of the ground as they're beginning to thrive on decaying roots that are under the ground system. We're even talking about between your toes of all places, warm, wet places for the fungus to grow. When we talk about all these situations, then these would be the ones that are outside in the woods. But we can also talk about, you know, some food that might have been left in your lunchbox that you totally forgot all about it. You seal it up, it gets warm inside, it's dark, it's moist, and uh, your fungus or mold begins to grow. And mold is indeed a fungus, as we talked about in uh, the previous section of our book. So when we talk about fungi then, the idea that a fungus is not an autotroph, but it's a heterotroph, gets a little confusing. Because there are times when we look at a fungus and we think, well, it's a plant, because it's not an animal. Well, it's in its own category, actually. So it's a heterotroph because there's no chlorophyll. There's no chloroplast. It doesn't use the sun's light to create its own energy. So how does it get energy is what we have to understand when it comes to how these things work. They're going to absorb nutrients out of whatever they're growing to. Now I say growing to because we see mushrooms and we see toadstools growing out of the ground and sometimes we think they're planted like a plant, but they're not. They're actually finding pieces of wood or other things that are underground and they're slowly decaying. So they attach themselves to it and they begin to break it down and then absorb the nutrients out of that decaying material. We're talking about a hyphae. A hyphae is how the structure of the neck, what we would think of the stem of a flower, the neck or the stem of the mushroom or toadstool, the fungus is made up of. Their bed branch, excuse me, they're all wound together, but they're branches of tubes that tightly wind. Now, depending on what type of fungus it is, some of them are more spread out. But when you get in specifically to toadstools and mushrooms that have the stem on them, they're really wound tight together. And those things are hollow tubes, and each one has their own. And what they do is they go down into the organism, the dead organism that they're attached to. So let's talk about a log. If we see fungus growing on a log, like on that previous slide, then they have sunk in these hyphae, these tubes, into that old log, and they're going to insert digestive chemicals. Okay, so we have digestive chemicals inside of our stomach, and our stomach is going to begin to break them down. It's called stomach acid. Well, these have their own type of acid, though they don't have stomach. And they're going to insert their hyphae into that log, and then it's going to begin to dissolve the log and break it down. It's a slow process, yes, but it's amazing the fact that what these items do. And then they're going to suck it up. It's going to get absorbed and they're going to shoot it up into this part. And this part is where they create their spores to reproduce. But it's just like you and I sucking a drink or something out of a straw. 
That's how a fungus works. It sticks its straw-like hyphae into the organism, begin to break it down, and then they suck up the nutrients throughout its entire body so that it can continue to grow. Now, they have two specific roles that they play in our world, and they're important roles. They are decomposers and they're recyclers. So when we talk about decomposers, they're going to break down organic material. And when we say organic, now that's a, a key term when it comes to buying groceries and foods now because they don't use chemicals and stuff. But when we talk about organic when it comes to science, we're talking about something that used to be alive, used to be a living organism, that log in the woods that used to be a tree but has fallen over and is dying and decaying. It is still made up of organic material even though it's not alive. It, the decomposers then breaks down the organic material. If you imagine all of the plants and animals that have died in our world over the thousands of years that man has been here, if nothing broke them down or decayed them, where would we live? Where would we go? You know, We have decomposers in our world. They're called detritivores for a reason. They break everything down that's dead and decaying and they return it back to its nutrients, which is the recycling part of it, into the soil, into the world around us. So the idea of recycling means what once was a living organism, the tree, that took soils, the soil, minerals, um, and nutrients and used it to grow and live, well now it's falling down, it's dying and decaying, and the fungus and the other uh, decomposers are breaking it down and putting those nutrients back in the soil. And if you think about the Lion King, where they talk about the circle of life, it's really what we're talking about. Things that were alive, they die and they decompose, they get their nutrients back into the world, and then the world brings forth life again. And it goes around and around and around. It recycles. Their roles are to make sure things get decomposed, and then they recycle the minerals and the vitamins back into the world so they can be used once again. Some of them serve as food. I like mushrooms. I like stuffed mushrooms. I like mushrooms on my pizza. I like mushrooms in my pasta sauce. My wife, not so much. She can't do mushrooms. Some people like mushrooms and some people don't. Some people know which ones they can eat. They go out into the woods and they pick them and they go after really big ones and they have competitions and things like that in the fall. You know, the other thing is, is that we find out here in this moment that they help us with diseases. They'll help us fight off diseases. One of the areas that we use um, fungus most often probably is bread, even though we don't think about it being bread. So when we talk about the yeast, we learned when we talked about the different kingdoms, yeast is actually a fungus. And we put it into our bread mixture, and when we sit it in a warm place, we can watch our bread rise. So if you've ever made bread, you end up with a pretty sticky glob dough, and you put it in the pan. But then you give it some time. And as it sits there, it begins to swell and get bigger and bigger and bigger. So what's happening is that yeast has been activated. Basically, you added water to it, so it rehydrated it and it came to life again. And now there's sugar inside of this mixture. And it begins to eat the sugar. And as it eats the sugar, it produces carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide makes the bread swell and it begins to grow. It's going to add these air bubbles into your bread. And from a flat little lump of bread, it swells up or out, depending on if it's in a container or not. And we have all of these air pockets. And all of those air pockets are what's going to cause the bread to rise. It's expanding, actually, it's not rising, but it expands. It makes soft, fluffy bread. If you don't have yeast, then you have what is called flat breads. Here's all sorts of examples of flat breads, and flat breads are still good and yummy and tasty, they just don't have the yeast in them to make them big and fluffy. Now this individual, when we talk about Alexander Fleming, I picked this picture because I think it's kind of funny. He looks absolutely terrified and intimidating. But this man has saved millions of people from the research that he did. He was growing some bacteria um, and some spores inside of petri dishes, 
and he noticed that in one of the petri dishes there's a little piece of mold where nothing else was growing around it and he began to hypothesize that huh some molds will kill bacteria or at least fight them off and he began to test and research and he found out that there's a particular mold called penicillin that is really good at fighting off bacteria and so he created a medicine we can get penicillin in all sorts of different pills and you've heard of penicillin and amoxicillin and those type of things they're all categories of penicillin and you can get it in liquid form or pills but it's this that began as a byproduct of fungus of mold that he found out kills a lot of bacteria that make us really really sick so people take it they're not eating mold and I would never suggest that you eat mold if you're not feeling well because you're gonna feel even worse it's been cleansed and used and parts of the products that it creates is going to make medicine there's several different types of molds that he began that research on that has cured millions of people from basic illnesses and sicknesses and get them healthy again he's an amazing individual that's truly affected the lifespan of human human beings one of the th ways that fungus affects us in this area is for our farms there are several of you whose mom and dads are farmers or your grandpas or your uncles people that you know neighbors are farmers we have crops all around us i remember as a kid my grandpa wasn't necessarily a farmer but he did rent out his property so 20 of the 40 acres was used to raise crops we could see this stuff every once in a while creeping in it this is called corn smut and it's this fungus that gets inside the corn kernels themselves and they begin to grow and expand and turn black and if you let it get to a point where it dries out then that casing from the corn kernel breaks open and this black powder comes out well that's the spores from that fungus that's called corn smut and if they break out it's going to spread because all it needs is a little bit of a wind to carry it around and it lands and it inserts itself in the corn and it begins to spread and grow again another one that I haven't had much experience with other than one time when I was a kid is when it comes to wheat because I didn't know a lot of people that grew wheat but out in the Midwest or uh, in the West I guess is a really big problem hopefully none of the farmers have struggled with this but this is what's called wheat rust and it's called wheat rust because when you are further back kind of has a rusty color to it but it's this hard fungus that begins to grow and infect your wheat and it destroys your crops we've had millions of acres of crops that have been destroyed from these two funguses or fungi so we have to make sure that we watch out for those and you'll see that there are farmers they inspect their crops all year long and they make sure that they put different chemicals on them to try to keep this from ever coming in to their crops but another way that fungus is harmful to us is something that as a wrestling coach we really try to fight it's called ringworm people call it ringworm because they think it kind of looks like a worm I guess I don't really know but it makes these red circles with a white center it's not a worm at all it's a fungus and this fungus is found in soil so if I'm walking across on the ground I could get ringworm fungus on my shoes it's a natural occurring thing out in the environment but the problem is is if I get it on my skin I could end up with these big rashes it's very contagious so in wrestling we clean our mats every single day with a chemical that tries to prevent that from happening you can't always prevent it from happening but we strive to do a good job another fungus that affects not wrestlers but all athletes is called athlete's foot it's a fungus that gets inside of showers and locker rooms because it also is a fungus that's found out on the ground so if I'm walking across the ground I'm going into the school and I take my shoes off that could be inside there it's a natural occurring thing out in our environment but what it does is it attaches to the bottom of your feet and it begins to break down the skin on your feet it's kind of gross it's uncomfortable yes I had it when I was in college it's the only time I've had to experience it but it's not fun 
But guess what? They're pretty easy to treat. The nice thing is, is we can go to doctors and we get what's called an antifungal medicine or cream. And all it means is it's going to go and fight the fungus that has caused this. Takes a couple of days, making sure you treat them and wash them to keep it clean. And both of those go away pretty quick and you no longer have any side effects from it. Should be a pretty quick video. You should be able to get it done today, even though it's a two hour delay and we're not actually having science. And then when you come to class tomorrow, which will be Thursday, I'll give you your assignment. My goal is to have your study guide done today or tomorrow, so that tomorrow morning, so you can have it tomorrow in class. If not, you'll definitely get it for Friday. Your test, once again, is next Tuesday. There won't be anything on my test that's not on my study guide, unless it's bonus questions of things that I've talked about that you should know by now. Watch the video, make sure that you uh, understand what we're talking about, and then I'll see you in class tomorrow.